Good evening, ladies. My name is Tony Dukes. This is Carissa Gorder and Annie Heskett. And we're here tonight to talk to you about your transition out of college athletics into the professional workforce. Tonight, we're going to talk to you a little bit about how to transition from being just a college athlete into the workforce and what it means to be a woman in the workforce. Carissa will touch upon a few points tonight that may seem like you've heard them before or maybe a few common sense items, but we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into it so that we as women can understand what it means to feel empowered and enter the workforce. And all of you are juniors and seniors, so you should all be thinking about what you are going to do after you graduate. And I know that it's hard to conceptualize because you identify as a student athlete, it's what you do day in, day out, but once you're done being a student athlete, there's just a big transition that's gonna happen and we wanna prepare you the best we can. So what we're gonna talk about is a lot of different things that are gonna help you, even with like the emotional and also with professional development as far as um, when you make your first impression or what right. happens. On our agenda, we're gonna cover first impressions, verbal and nonverbal communication in the workplace, professional dress, personal branding, and then we'll have Q&A with a panel of female formal student athletes, and then we're going to wrap it up. You may be wondering why all three of us are up here today. So not only do we have a passion for helping student athletes, we also all three are former student athletes ourselves. So Tony's going to tell you a little bit about his experience as an athlete. Uh, my experience as an athlete, I would play uh, basketball uh, at the junior college level, Division One and Division Two level. Uh, after my experience in college, I actually went on to work with women's basketball teams and professional athletes, uh, in which I learned a lot about how how they prepare themselves during college and after college. So, I believe my my experiences will help you all uh, carry on you guys' work after college. And I am a recent graduate from Northern Arizona University where I ran cross country and track. And so I had to transition out of college athletics as well. And it was honestly really difficult for me because I didn't have anything like this program to prepare me. So I ran my last track meet and I moved home a week later and I was graduated and I basically had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know who I was. And I fell into a really low time personally just because I didn't know how to act, I didn't know where to work, I didn't know what to do with myself because all of my structure was gone. Um, so we really want to prepare you guys to enter into the workplace, but also just be prepared to have that element of your life just change drastically once you do graduate. And similar experience as Carissa, I'm a former softball student athlete and following graduation I went into the coaching field and started coaching and entering the professional workforce immediately and was a little lost. I didn't have the same network or the same resources and I wasn't quite sure of myself. So we are here tonight to help deliver this message to you and help you know, build some sort of foundation for you girls to build off of and to enter into the workforce with a little bit more, um, a little bit more knowledge, knowledge and confidence <laughs> than we had. So the first thing that we're gonna go over today is how to make a good first impression. So when you're networking or when you have an interview or when you're just meeting anybody in the professional world in general, you really want to know how to make your presence known and you don't want to be shy or intimidated because I know as women sometimes we can be intimidated, especially depending on what field you go into. If you're going into a male-dominated field, you're going to have to interact with a lot of males who have a higher administrative position than you. And so when you come in, you have to make sure that you come in confidently and that you know how to carry yourself in order to best come across as someone who is suitable for the job, if that's the scenario, or just as someone who is very confident in themselves and in their work. So the first thing, of course, when you meet someone is a really good handshake. So when you're shaking someone's hand, the worst thing you can do is give them like the little wimpy fish handshake. That is not a good way to go about it because it does not assert that you're confident in yourself. You do not need to be weak or you do not need to come in as being unsure of yourself. You need to shake their hand confidently. So if I'm going to shake Tony's hand, I'm going to come in, I'm going to do this. I'm going to squeeze his hand really firmly, and I'm going to look him in the eye when I say, Hi, I'm Carissa. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Tony Goodness. <laughs> See? So that's how it should go. What you want to avoid is coming in like this. Hi. Because this is, first of all, it's awkward because they don't know how to grab your hand. 
Second of all, it does not really say that you're confident in yourself because it's just, it's just kind of weak, a little bit weak, and we want to come across as confident. So that's how we want to shake someone's hand when we meet them. And like I said, good eye contact is key. So if you look someone in the eye when you shake their hand and you meet them, they're going to more remember your face, they're going to remember you because, I mean, you're just having good etiquette, basically. So you want to shake their hand confidently, look them in the eye, smile, be pleasant. Another thing is to stand tall. So your posture should not be slouched. You shouldn't turn away from people. I know for me, I have a really bad habit of holding my arms across my body, which is something that communicates that you're not sure of yourself. You're trying to kind of block yourself, cover yourself, and it doesn't really come across that well. So you want to stand confidently, you want to stand tall. So when you meet someone, if you face them straight on, then that's going to come across way more confident and just way better in general, rather than turning, slouching, putting your head down, looking at the floor, any of those things. And it is uncomfortable at first. So honestly, you need to go to as many networking events as you can. Go to career fairs, even if there's no career there that you even are interested in in a little bit. It's really good to go to those so that you can practice meeting people, networking, and just practice those things because those are people that maybe you're not trying to impress because you don't want that job or it's not in your field. That's fine. But if you can practice all of these things, so when you do go to a career fair or you are meeting somebody in the field that you want to work in, then it'll come across as natural, you'll be used to it, and everything will go okay. So the last thing that I'll touch on as far as making a first impression, say you meet someone, you have great conversation, you feel really good about the exchange, and then they want to offer you their business card. That's awesome. You want to take that, but there is a certain way that you should take that business card from them because you don't want it to seem like you don't care. A mistake that a lot of people could make, say someone gives you their business card and they say, okay, thanks. Don't look at it. They put it somewhere randomly in their pocket. They don't really know what to do with it. That doesn't really come across well to the person that offered it to you. You want to make that exchange meaningful. And honestly, even though it's something you might not think about, it's definitely something that's communicated subconsciously. So if Tony's going to give me his business card, I'm going to take it. I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to look at it. Then, hopefully, since we've all given you business card holders, you take that out and you place it inside. Um, or you can use like your wallet or something. But I'm not just going to kind of shove it in here and make it weird. I don't want to crumple it up. I want to take it from him. Maybe I'll shake his hand again. Thank you. And then I'll put it away. So that's a way to take a business card because you want to make sure that you're being respectful, that you want to make it communicated that it meant something to you and that you're happy about the exchange that you had. All right, and the next thing that we'll go over are verbal and nonverbal communication elements that can really either help or hinder you in the workplace. So it's really important to kind of be able to self-monitor um, when you're in the workplace, both verbally and nonverbally. So the first thing that we have here, so picture yourself in a meeting setting, really. You're in a group, um, you're at a conference, and you need to communicate with those around you, both male and female. So the first thing you want to make sure you're doing is that you're speaking loud enough for everybody to hear you. Okay, so this is something that we don't really monitor a lot. So say that someone is in the room, you try to offer an idea, they can't hear you, they have to ask you to repeat yourself, that makes you uncomfortable, and it's just kind of a downward spiral from there. When you're offering your opinion or your idea, do so confidently. And it's okay if it's something that falls flat or people aren't really on board with it. That's what brainstorming and that's what being at a meeting is all about. So if you speak with high volume, basically, or if you speak loud enough for everybody to hear you, then it's just going to go way better um, just from there. And the next thing that I want to touch on is huge, being a female. So you don't have to ask permission. So a lot of times in a meeting setting, a woman will raise her hand or they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? You don't have to do that. You don't have to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a question. And if you think about it, kind of reflect and see if you do that very often. I know for me, when I learned about this, I realized I do it all the time, which is not okay. Um, you do not have to say sorry, and you don't have to ask, may I ask a question? Because if you picture a male doing that in the conference room, then it kind of comes off as, as awkward. I, I can't really picture a man saying, oh, I'm sorry, can I ask a question, or may I ask a question? Um, being a female, you don't have to do that either. Just ask your question. And another thing that kind of piggybacks off of that is you don't have to qualify your statements. So you don't have to say, I'm sorry, this might be a bad idea, or 
you guys might not be on board with this, but I'm going to kind of give it to you anyway. You don't have to say that. It's an idea. That's the whole reason that you voice it is because it's an idea and you want to see if other people are on board. Um, you don't voice it just to be, um, or just to lack confidence or anything like that. So you definitely want to just say, okay, I have an idea and put it out there. You don't ask if you can give it to them. You don't um, apologize or qualify it before you state it. Just give your idea. It comes across as much more confident. And these are very, very small things, but it's kind of a big deal, honestly, because when you're in a room and if you're in a male-dominated field, then you want to make sure that you come across confidently and that you're sure of yourself and you're sure in your work. And honestly, as qualified professionals who are emerging from whichever program you're a part of right now, you all are going to be very well prepared in the workforce. So you shouldn't lack confidence in that area. Um, depending on where you go, I mean, you fill out the application for a job, you interview for a job, and you get the job for a reason. Because they believe in you and you're a good fit for that program. So you should be able to be in these types of settings and do so with confidence. Um, just make sure that whenever you put your ideas out there, you just are proud of them. And then another thing that we're going to go over are nonverbal communication elements. <laughs> so, another thing we'll go over are nonverbal communication elements. So, when you're in a meeting setting, think of this you should sit tall. So, if you check out our little picture right here, obviously this is exaggerated, but it's hard to monitor yourself like that and be engaged in a meeting at the same time. This is true. Um, but you do want to make sure that you are sitting tall in your meeting, or even if you're standing and speaking with someone. You don't want to slouch on the table or lean way back in your seat because that does not communicate the fact that you're engaged. You need to be engaged in the setting, um, engaged in the subject at hand, and be ready to give good comments and good feedback when necessary. So if you all check yourselves right now during this little presentation, how many of you have gone into a slouch position or are leaning over on your arms. Um, those are the kind of things that we need to be aware of. And yes, we go through many things throughout our day that make us really tired. Um, we get sleepy. Maybe the environment in the room isn't the best if it's dark or if it's too warm. But these are things that we need to be thinking about when we're in the workplace because we want to be seen by others as someone who's engaged and someone who's ready to give their advice or give their opinion or their ideas. So this is something you constantly need to be thinking of because other people see it immediately and it may be the last thing on your mind. Um, and then the last thing as well, when you're listening. Listening is huge, so make sure you're listening to understand, not to respond. So frequently when we're engaged in conversation, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting, we're simply listening and we just can't wait to say what we're going to say. And we're crafting that message in our brains while the person is still giving us information, and so that information is not being very well received. Because we're constantly thinking about how we're going to respond. And sometimes when you make that response and you haven't listened completely, there can be a large disconnect there. And then bad things can just happen from there. So what you want to do when you're in a meeting setting or one-on-one, -on -one, you just want to make sure that you're listening to understand the message that they're giving you. And it can be big, it can be small, it doesn't really matter what the setting is. This is just going to make you a way better communicator in general. And as a female, we do need to be very good at our communication skills so that we come across well. Um, just to make sure that we are being proud of what we do and that we're confident in our, basically in ourselves in the workplace, um, wherever you are. So if you listen to understand the message, wait for them to complete what they're saying, and then respond, your exchange is going to be of a lot higher quality. It might be a lot more, um, it'll be faster, it'll be more efficient and ideas will be exchanged cleanly rather than trying to navigate around any miscommunications. So it's a big deal to make sure that you listen to understand, not to respond, and that you just constantly engage. Um, that's verbally and non-verbally. And then after this, we're going to talk about professional dress. So we know that you guys hear about this all the time, but it is something that we do need to go over because as females in the workplace, we still see women who are not dressing appropriately um, in the office, in the workplace, or what have you. And it does depend on the job. So we understand that at different offices, it's going to be super casual. So maybe you can get away with wearing casual gear. Um, if any of you are going into a coaching field, then obviously your coach isn't going to show up to work every single day and be at practice in a full suit or in heels. But you do need to be aware of the fact that there is going to be professional dress regulations wherever you go, probably, in your office or in your workplace. And you need to know kind of how to navigate those. 
And I know a lot of us, especially maybe at your age or what you're used to wearing when you get dressed up, probably isn't super appropriate for an office setting. And you can look good and be professional at the same time. It is possible. Um, so when you are dressing for an interview or a career fair or if you do get the job and you're dressing for your job, you just need to keep some certain things in mind, obviously. Um, don't think that you can't have style just because you have to dress professionally. There's a lot of cute professional clothes out there, so don't worry. Um, but even if you just look in this picture, which is obviously a super stiff looking picture, but still, their outfits are examples of how to dress business professional. So you can wear the jacket, um, and it doesn't really matter like what you wear under, as long as it's not showing a lot of your upper region, then you're okay. And as long as you're wearing a skirt or pants that are long enough. So obviously we don't want to come in with a mini skirt, um, or even a skirt that's ill-fitting. That's another thing too. So say you get clothing that maybe it covers you up perfectly, but maybe it doesn't really fit you super well. We don't want to come across as not being super well polished, or um, not being professional because we are monitoring how our clothes are fitting us. So if something, if a shirt is maybe long enough while you're standing, but then you go to reach for something and it comes up too high. Um, or if your pants fit fine, but then you bend down to get something and they come too low. So things like that that are sometimes overlooked, make sure that your clothes are fitting regardless of what you're going to be doing throughout the day. It's huge. Um, and also the difference between business casual and business professional. Of course, there's a line there, and it's sort of hard to navigate as women. I know a lot of males, if it's business casual, they wear khakis and a polo, and it's fine. They look good that way. Um, but a lot of females, we don't really enjoy wearing khakis and polos. Some of us do, some of us don't. Um, but if it's business casual, basically that's kind of saying you don't have to wear a blazer. You can wear a sweater or a long sleeve blouse or even just a regular blouse at that. Um, Maybe you don't wear heels, you wear flats instead, something like that. So these are just small things that definitely communicate the kind of person you are in the workplace. So if you show up to a meeting or an interview and you're dressed well, and then you make a good first impression because you have a firm handshake, you look them in the eye, and you know what you're talking about, that's going to make a big difference in comparison to the person who comes in not dressed well, they have a weak handshake, they don't make a lot of good eye contact, and then they aren't confident in themselves. That's going to set you miles apart, and it's not even diving into the fact about maybe you have a wider knowledge base than that other candidate. Um, so that's just the way you can present yourself and come across as more professional. And so there's a lot of things to keep in mind, but these are tools that are going to help you, I mean, from your transition out of college athletics and beyond. So if you can put these into action, you'll definitely be more prepared and make sure that you're constantly kind of practicing. You never want to feel rusty or out of practice if you go up to somebody and you think, oh goodness, and then you have to think of all these things at the same time. How do I make a uh, good first impression? What do I do? Just practice and it'll come across naturally um, and then you'll be good to go. All right, so now that you've all learned how to make a good first impression and how to be confident in yourselves in the workplace, I'm going to turn it over to Annie who's going to address some social media issues with all of you. So today I'm going to talk to you about your favorite subject, social media. Now I know this is something that gets hammered into your heads as student athletes. You know, you're a platform for your school, you're a representative of your team, so you hear it all the time. Watch what you put on social media, make sure that you're in compliance with everything, stuff like that. But we're going to go a little bit deeper into it because social media is actually an embodiment of yourself and your brand. And today, professionals and the hiring committees, everyone is looking into your social media. So if you apply, apply for a job, they are going to look at the different social media platforms that you use and essentially interview you before you've even stepped into the building. Recruiting and hiring being very similar. I have a great story for you all. Um, during a time when I was recruiting and you know looking to pick up players, checking social media accounts, um, I found out that there was a lot of things I could learn about a girl before she even stepped into my office or stepped onto a field. So I carried that on into you know developing my own players. So I was setting up a social media seminar just like this one, and I wanted to give them examples of what it looked like when they you know, looked into their own social media profile. So I took the liberty of looking up a few of the girls' social media accounts to give them examples of, hey, this is what everyone can see on your profile, or this is what coach can see on your profile, stuff like that. And the first girl that I googled, her Twitter handle came up immediately. 
and it was public. So of course I click on it and you know, it was supposed to be the first day of practice the next day and she had on her Twitter how great it was to go out and get drunk the night before. And it was public, it was free for everybody to see, it was the day, the night before her first practice as a college athlete, so we got to start off on the wrong foot. So needless to say, all of you are student athletes, you know what happens the next day, and we do a little respect the game practice, so the whole team ran for that mistake. But that's a social media mistake, right? And not to say that she shouldn't have done that, because she definitely shouldn't have gone and gotten drunk, but she also shouldn't have had her public her profile public or posted it on social media. So we just want to be conscious of what we're doing and what we're putting on social media. So we're going to look at why it matters. 94% of recruiters use or plan to use social media in their recruitment efforts. So that means the great majority of those people out there hiring you or looking to hire you are going to take a look at your social media accounts. 78% of those recruiters have made a hire through social media. So not only are they looking at social media, they're also using social media as a way to navigate the hiring process. They're going to use you know, our LinkedIn or even look at your social media to communicate with you about potential job offers. So what we want to take a look at is reflecting on ourselves. Are you hireable? That's the main question we want to ask ourselves. I know for me, coming out of college, um, I didn't necessarily monitor maybe uh, my Facebook very well. I thought, you know, no one, I only accept my friends onto Facebook. No one's looking at that. But in reality, do you really know your privacy settings? So, your personal brand. These are a few things about our personal brand and our social media accounts that we want to take a look at. What is your name? So, if you're using your, you know, government issued name and what everybody is going to search you by during the hiring process, that's great. We do not want to make it difficult for employers to look us up. We want to be able to put ourselves out there, put our brand out there, and be identifiable. What's your username? So I know a lot of us probably came up with our Twitter handle a few years ago, right? It might not be the most professional thing you've ever seen. So we want to take a look at that and rework it. Um, you want to, for myself, I used to have some cute little name on my Twitter handle. My Twitter handle now is Annie Heskin. It's just my name. We also want to take a look at our picture. So this is huge. What picture do you have as your profile pic? What pictures are public to everyone else? You know, you may have some pictures on your Facebook or your Twitter, Instagram, things like that that aren't public to everybody else, but what are people seeing when they search you? Also, the big point here we want to hit on is our privacy settings. So public versus private. Um, I'm going to put my coaching hat on for a second because as a coach, when recruiting an athlete, which is essentially the same as hiring an employee, I took a look at everything. Okay? I jumped into everybody's social media accounts, looked at what they're putting out there. You want to know what information is being presented. There's um, a setting on Facebook where you can look at your own Facebook profile from the views of others. So I can go on there and see what my friends see, what the public sees, what I see, so that you know what people are seeing when they view your page. We also need to know our profiles. So know what you have out there. If you made, you know, maybe a Facebook or an Instagram years ago and you're not really monitoring it or it's still out there, it could be public, you know. So we want to make sure we check those privacy settings on everything and make sure that we are aware of everything that's out there of ourselves. All right, so going straight into that, we are gonna do a fun little game. We are going to each take out your computers or your phones, and I want you to take a look at yourself. Now, obviously you're not gonna Google yourself. You are going to Google your name, okay? Do variations of your name if you need to, if you use different names or um, the name you would give an employer. I want you to take a look at Google, take a look at Yahoo, um, use different search engines because different employers will use different things and take a look at what pops up. I want you to look at, we'll take Google for instance, look at the first Google page. Take a look at what social media accounts come up right away and you know some of you may have news articles about yourself, being athletes, like we're always in the spotlight, something like that. I want you to note anything that you may be a little embarrassed to share with me or to share with your coach right now. If there's anything like that, take note of it for yourself. You don't have to share with us. You don't have to tell us right now, but just keep that in mind. I also want you to click on Google Images. 
see what comes up. Take note of those as well if there's anything you're embarrassed about or you have concerns about. So we're going to take a few minutes for that and we'll come back. So now that we've all taken a little bit of time to do some research into ourselves, I hope we were all pleased with what we found, but if we're not, um, we're going to take a few steps, you know, to recover. Because although it's the internet and what you put out there is out there, there are a few ways that we can edit what is out there. So the main thing that I want to touch on is keeping your brand consistent. So if you have a professional profile or a personal profile, you want to make sure that those that are out there, um, they match up. We don't want to look like we have two different personas out there because an employer will see that too. Um, and although we may have professional accounts, um, our personal accounts are still probably searchable. So as an employer, as a coach, recruiting, looking out there, they will be able to see both of those. So consistency is key. Now, the few steps that we're gonna take in order to edit our social media profiles is we wanna audit ourselves. And by auditing ourselves, it's exactly what we started here. We searched ourselves. We looked up what is out there. What is everyone seeing about us? Now, once we've audited, you wanna delete. Now, deleting can be hard. I know for me personally, I had a bunch of pictures up there from when I was in undergrad. You know, great times, living it up, the young college life. Not exactly what you want to have on your social media accounts. Okay, hide those. Put those as private. Put those on your computer. Save those for yourself. When you get older, you know, and you want to share those memories later down the road, that's great. But probably not what you want to have on there when you're entering the professional world. Now, if there's any doubt, if you look at a picture or you look at a post, there's any doubt in your mind that an employer or you know, another professional looking at your page would kind of question what you're, what you're trying to get out there or would maybe see you in a different light or negative light, we want to delete. So any doubt, delete. Delete or hide. Okay, so step three, this one's key. Update your professional sites. So a lot of us may be new to LinkedIn or um, are just now developing more professional social networks. These sites are what's going to link you and network you with other professionals. So we want to make sure that these are up to date as possible. I know myself, um, when I got LinkedIn, that it struggled a little bit. I didn't necessarily take the time to add to it as I did maybe my Instagram or my Facebook because, let's face it, it's just not as fun as the other ones. But these websites are what people are going to see and these hiring committees and these professionals that are looking into you, those are what they're going to hire off of. Um, it's going to show all of your accomplishments, it's going to show your skills and you know, what you're good at is take this time to highlight everything about yourself. You know, your Facebook may show you uh, your best side or your greatest angles, but your LinkedIn is going to show what skills are going to get you hired. You know, what skills are going to push you further and higher in the workforce. Now, we've already talked about privacy settings, just really key, especially with our professional and our personal. So if we're trying to keep it consistent, Make sure that, you know, if you want to keep that personal account, you want to put whatever it is, show your friends and everything like that, make sure all your privacy settings are arranged how you want them, you know. So just take a look at it. You can, um, there's places on Facebook, Twitter, different areas where you can go on and you can look. So just make sure that you're knowledgeable of what you're putting out there. And step five is to continue to edit. So continue to edit means when we're posting something, you know, we want to take a look at ourselves take a look at who's seeing it, and make sure that before we post it, we've edited it. So there's a lot of times where you may be in the moment, you know, maybe you're a little fired up about something and you, you want to react or you want to post a picture right off the bat. Take a look, make sure that it's, you know, professionally approved, and then you can post it. So just continue to edit yourselves. Um, this is essentially another recruiting process. All of you ladies here, you went through it. You know what it means. You know what it takes to be recruited, to put your best foot out there for someone to want to hire you, to want to get you. And now, Tony Dukes is here. He's going to introduce probably the most exciting portion of this programming for you. All right. Now we're going to have a panel in which we have four beautiful women who've taken the time out of their busy schedules, who are actually professionals in the industry. And... Um, are going to actually sit down and take questions from you to, to see, you know, how, how they got to where they are today. We have Dr. Meg Hancock, Christine Exeter, 
Amy Calabrese, and Michelle Vasquez. Okay, we have Dr. Meg Hancock, who is the Assistant Chair of the Department of HSS in, at the University of Louisville. And she is also a, a professor here in the Sport Administration Department. All right, next we have Christine Exeter, who used to play soccer here at the University of Louisville. She is now at the Mississippi State University, where she is an academic coordinator. Next, we have Amy Calabrese, who is the Assistant AD for Student Athlete Development. And she also played soccer here at the University of Louisville. Next, we have Michelle Vasquez, who is the Director of Events at the NFCA, who also was a softball player here at the University of Louisville. Now, I will hand it over to these ladies who will give more information about their experiences in this career and hopefully give you all helpful feedback uh, to your questions as far as moving up this ladder in this field. Alright, so first we'd like to thank our panel for being wonderful resources for us tonight. Um, I'm really glad that you guys got a lot of your questions answered and if you felt like you didn't get your question answered or you didn't have the opportunity, please, please stay after, come talk to them, they're willing to stay um, after our program is over so that you can come talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. If you want to ask them individual questions or something about their experience really piqued your interest, make sure you use them as resources. And these are just a few examples of the former student athlete resources that you can use here. So, of course we chose these four women because they're excellent examples of females that have transitioned successfully out of um, college athletics into the workplace, but there are so many more here at the University of Louisville that you can reach out to. Ask them who they know, ask them who they work with, who's empowered them, who they've networked with, and that has made a difference in their lives, and that can spread your network as well. And then make sure you're meeting each other. Um, I know in our day-to-day -day schedules, you hang out with your teammates, uh, you oftentimes are just with each other, and you get very comfortable there. But honestly, if you look around at how many female student athletes are in this room, you are all going to be each other's network once you move on from here. You never know where each of you will end up. If some of you are going into the same career, then those are people that you can use as resources in the future. So make sure you build those connections while you can. Because like we said, the transition can feel a little bit abrupt once you're in it. Once you graduate and you're done with your eligibility, you're going to move on and all of your resources here at the University of Louisville, although most will be available to you, it will be in a much more distant um, relation. So you're not going to have them firsthand right here for you to stop by their office or schedule a meeting. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to reach out to them. So make sure you're making those connections now. So this is a perfect time once we wrap up here to talk with each other, talk with our panelists, and make sure that you're just forming those connections. If you want to practice your handshakes or how to take a business card, this would be a perfect time. But if you do have more questions for them, make sure that you're taking advantage of that. So we'd like to thank you all for your time. We hope that you all learned a lot here at our program just to make sure that you're prepared for your futures, you're prepared for the transition after college athletics. Um, and we know that you're all going to successfully enter the professional workplace. All of you are going in different directions, but we're super excited to see where you go. If you do have more questions about professional development or you want to seek out more resources, please come see us because we can definitely direct you to the right places. There are a myriad of resources on this campus that we can connect you to. And make sure that you're always practicing. Um, like I said before, you never want to feel out of place or uncomfortable in a situation when you are networking or when you're preparing to graduate, ready to make that leap into the professional world. So make sure that you're keeping these things in mind. Um, hopefully you all took notes in your pad folios that we gave you. You all have business card holders now, so that way you can utilize those as well. So make sure that you're preparing, that you're practicing, and that you're confident when you interact with one another. Um, and that's going to offer you a very smooth transition from college athletics into the, work, into the workplace. So we thank you for all of your time, and if you want to head out, you can, but if you'd like to stay a little while longer and talk, then you can do that as well.